you gotta say hello. You're such a bad starter of a video. You gotta greet the people. They're here for you. Okay, ready? Hey, hi, hello, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess. This is Nigel, who's already bored, apparently. And welcome back to another installment of Book Community, where I try to keep you abreast of the goings on and the shenanigans in the bookish community. And I try, I try so hard, but so much is happening that I can't keep up, right? I've been trying to uh, get my assistant here to help, but uh, he's like, I don't have opposable thumbs, so I can't help. I'm like, I don't wanna hear that. Am I boring you? Bye, boy. Also, new frames, who dis? The world's a different place now. It's so clear and crisp. Before it was real dingy and fuzzy, but not sponsored, but it could be sponsored. Zenny Optical, holla at your girl. <laughs> so we're gonna start with something. If you're on Twitter, you probably have seen, there were less sub tweets about this this time, which thank the Lord, but there's still some. So if you didn't know, there is a very popular author, Jay Kristoff, who has a book coming out later this year, maybe like September. And it's called Empire of the Vampire, a new adult book. And recently it was revealed that the book is getting not one, not two, but four different ARC editions. Really the only difference is the color, I believe, of the ARC, but there are four editions of the ARC. And the book community got some feelings about it. So if you go to his website, it has the information about the ARCs. What I didn't realize before going to his website is that the ARCs are hardcover from this uh, this photo and they say advanced is a special advanced reader edition so not even just advanced reader copy like this is a special advanced reader edition um, and so there's an, a charity arc giveaway rules are simple winners are random but together we can raise much needed funds for an amazing cause last time we did this i didn't know he did it before we raised over 10 grand for the mighty sea shepherd and this year, all four copies of the U.S. Empire of the Vampire arc set up for grabs. I think we can do better. So you go to the link and donate to his favorite charity, which is the Sea Shepherd. So all you have to do is donate a dollar and that gets you one entry. But if you donate five dollars, that gets you five entries into the draw. And you can donate more if you like, but five entries is the max. And this is going to the Sea Shepherd. So he says he will personally match all donations combined up to $5,000. Can I help you, sir? Going to I'm talking about a white man, and here comes a white man interrupting me. Bye. Go have a good work. Get out of my camera. You really? I'm editing you out. It's unacceptable. I can't let the people know about you. I got to keep you a secret. Look at Nene. Look at him. Say bye bye. Have a good work out. I don't even know what I was saying. But I was so rudely interrupted. Yeah, bye. So under the FAQs, a question is, wait, there are four different advanced reader copies for Empire of the Vampire, but he says the UK also has one that's all red foil. And so there's five art copies. And it said, it's going to be hard enough to get one, said don't sweat, it's all the exact same arc inside. You don't need to collect them or anything, just you know, some droogs are into that shit. So it's the same book, same book, just four different colors. So a question, why in God's name do you do this to us? Well, why print special editions with sprayed edges and fancy alt covers and whatnot? Because it's fucking cool, that's why. So all of the arcs have a different symbol on the cover and those are crests of the four great vampire bloodlines in this book. And it said, wait, so four covers means four times as many arcs? He said, no, they're still gonna be rare and you should know that some of the illustrations will be absent from the arcs because they're trying to avoid spoilers. So I'm confused because at the be at the top it has a picture that is hardcover arcs and then the picture at the bottom, they look like paperback. So I don't, because this says, to get into the running to win a signed personalized set. Yes, this means all four, okay. So the giveaway, you get a set of the arcs. I'm assuming that's the hardcover ones and then the regular arcs that you can request or that they send out are going to be the paperback, I'm assuming. Either way, it's ridiculous. And so, of course, there's been a lot of conversation about this on Twitter and for multiple reasons. One, because of his um, problematic behaviors in the past and then a second discourse that also ties into that with uh, publishing and you know the things they say versus the things they do. So first, and I talked about this briefly in another video, but so Drake, Drake, 
not Drake. So Jay Kristoff's first series, I believe that was published was like The Lotus Wars. And it is an Asian inspired fantasy series. I haven't read it, but it had appropriated Japanese culture, I believe really terribly. So on that series, I think Storm Dancer may be one of the first books. This was a tweet thread that Ellen O, who is a young adult author, was talking about on Twitter. And so the tweet says, I'll start with Storm Dancer. It's a hot racist mess, but I want to focus on the fetishization of Asian women by the creepy male gaze. Every Asian woman is either a geisha, prostitute, or impure. And let's not forget the gross random dudes and the awful peephole bath scene. Every woman warrior might be deadly, but more importantly, they're hot. The Asian man character is violently brutalized and then immediately wants to have sex with her captor. All these women are hypersexualized. Now remember the shooting of six Asian women in Atlanta? The shooter killed Asian women because he claimed to have a sex fetish. There's a long and brutal history of sexual and physical violence against Asian women. And this book exists in the young adult stacks. And here's Storm Dancer contributing to that history. So that book, I've heard just very problematic things about the appropriation of the culture. And then now this also, there was also the, um, the poor representation of an indigenous culture from New Zealand in his Nevernight book. Um, and then along with his other um, sexualization of a young girl. So multiple things that people have issues with J.K. Strauss over the years. And, um, and then also people have noted that since those tragic murders in Atlanta, you know, a lot of people have spoken out and shared the hashtag, you know, like stop Asian hate, supported Asian American authors, and I mean, at least retweeted, posted infographic, whatever. And that Jay Kristoff has not done anything. He hasn't said anything to my knowledge or by other people, uh, tweets that they've shared since that has occurred, even though he has taken and appropriated Asian culture to his benefit, obviously in books that he's published and made money from. So, and even if he hadn't done that, he should have just shared it anyway, because it's something that's going on and I get it. He's not in America, but still it's, he's very, it's not like he's out of touch with things that are going on in the United States. So it just seemed strange. And people mentioned other authors like Rainbow Rowell and her portrayal of in Eleanor and Park and Marissa Meyer her portrayal of Asian or Asian culture in the Lunar Chronicles and how they have noticeably said nothing on the internet. And so that's a big problem within itself. Hi, yes. So he's already had those issues and he remains a popular author. And it's just seems so strange because he is very well known, especially in the bookish, our bookish worlds here online has very popular series that he would need an arc anyway. I don't understand that whole thing, but sure, make an arc, whatever. But four editions, but then there's other authors who are less well known, or maybe this is their, their debut, and they're being told that publishing can't afford to have print arcs or, you know, there's going to be a limited number or whatever. And there's still, I think we're still really behind with printing because of everything that happened last year there was like uh like paper shortages and then you know like obama's book came out and got like three million in the first printing and i think publishing is still like behind there with all of these various things that you've told other authors like we don't have the money or we don't have the resources right now because of the shortage but you can tell this popular author that we're gonna do four editions of an advanced reader copy. And then also I was watching the live stream that Marines did on her channel, um, talking about the drama that's happened in the first quarter of the year. And they were talking about, you know, how a lot of us, uh, when the Sasha Allsberg drama happened, were essentially on the side of publishing, like it's unethical to sell arcs. But then here is publishing like, well, you know, don't sell arcs, but here's a collector's edition. Like what, what does that say? You're spending all this money for something that you technically don't even make money on, but it's just supposed to be as a marketing piece to get the buzz out about the book. But why do you need four? Four different covers, nothing is different in the inside. That's literally just a collector's edition. It's like the finalized special editions, which someone noted there's like already six or seven. There's like a gold, Goldsboro, Waterstones, Forbidden Planet, a Barnes and Noble, at least. 
There's probably an Aluma crate. There's already so many special editions for the final book for this book. And now you have special arc editions. Make it make sense. And sure, the charity part is nice, but no, it just doesn't make sense. Because someone as cemented as Jay Kristoff already has a huge fan base. And another point they brought up in the live stream was, how effective is this um how effective is this arc campaign outside of like the bookish sphere because i feel like if you're not really in the bookish community you don't even really know what an arc is i didn't before i got online and found bookstagram um, and booktube i had no idea what an arc was i thought books just came out when they came out and you went to the store and you found them that's it so what what are they really doing it can't be that much more promotional and he doesn't need it he's already a best-selling author He's already doing well. People, even if you don't read his books, know his name for the most part. So why not use that time, that energy, that money, those resources for an author that it's their first book or they need more promotion? All right, so in the UK, Empire of the Vampire is being published under Harper Voyager, but in the United States, it's under St. Martin's Press, which is under Macmillan. And so I looked up Macmillan's statement from last year because you know every publisher came out with a statement saying they were gonna support black lives. And I'm not just saying black, I'm talking about publishers should be supporting black, indigenous, people of color by POC, but I just wanted to look up their statement, right? So the statement of Black Lives Matter and diversity and inclusion from Macmillan, this is August 6, 2020. We have watched the recent horrifying events in America with sadness and anger and have observed the protests that have arisen worldwide in response. They have reminded us that racism and prejudice is still insidious in our societies and that the issue must be effectively addressed. There is an urgent need for individuals and companies such as ours to be better allies to the black community, to educate ourselves on black issues and to commit to sustained and effective action to oppose racism and ensure that it has no place at Pan Macmillan. We have pledged that we will accelerate and expand this vital work. We have listened this week to the important conversations happening around us and to the thoughts of our colleagues and have taken stock of what this means for our business. These events have come as a brutal jolt and they have caused us to revisit our plans and conclude that we need to do more in order for Pan McMillan to be a more diverse company and to champion black as well as other underrepresented voices in our publishing and in our community. We are taking the time to educate ourselves on what it means to be effective allies to our diverse population in addition on how we can more effectively support our diversity and inclusion groups. Please see our diversity inclusion pledge below. Their pledge, Pam McMillan must become through our committed and more urgent efforts, a more inclusive and diverse place to work and an enterprise which better reflects the world we live in and the markets we serve. Our diversity and inclusion group established in January, 2020. Hold up, it was only established in January of 2020? Our diversity and inclusion group established in January 2020 has been set up to provide safe and productive spaces for people to have a voice on issues of race and diversity within and outside the business. This group will be supported in the work it was set up to do and it is instrumental to the way we tackle these issues. So it keeps going talking about. It's talking about them bringing in interns um, to create diversity in publishing, partnerships, creating a plan with specific measures and targets, um, let's see, committed to ensuring that people of color comprise 20% of their workforce and we remain a long way short, I'm sure you do, increasing their engagement with industry organizations over the next year, everyone will be receiving unconscious bias training and training on how to be an effective ally, um, giving each member of the com company one additional paid day off per year. Woo! We, the leadership team, pledges to take the time to educate ourselves and providing feedback, okay, okay? So, right, they said black and other underrepresented groups. And yet, so it just seems strange that you would put this much money behind a already successful white author instead of using that money to hype up a author that is part of the by POC group, it, you know, but... Did we really think they meant anything behind those statements that they put out last year? No, obviously not. They sounded nice, you know, it made people feel okay for a moment, but we knew they didn't mean shit behind that. It's just really disappointing. And then there were a lot of Asian authors who were expressing, you know, their feelings because they have books coming out. They're not getting this kind of um, hype and financial support behind their books. They have to look at someone who profited off of 
you know, using their culture in a really negative way, get supported and hyped up and, and really focused on. So are we surprised? No, but publishing just continues to be a raggedy ass mess and just continues to pretend that they don't have money when they do. Last week's video, when I was talking about them paying creators on TikTok and after talking with people in the comments, it's obviously publishing is a business and that is obviously what's driving sales. So of course they wanna pay people who are driving sales. At least that makes sense. This doesn't make sense because they're spending money on these arcs that, and arcs don't get them money. They're sent out to drive up marketing and everything, but how much more marketing are they gonna drive up than he already would have? Like he already has people breaking the internet for every website every time the book goes on sale. If he already has fans that have been fans of his for a long time, so if they're putting all this money into something that typically doesn't give you money back directly from the arc itself because no one's paying for those, then how does that make sense to put so much money into this? I don't know, I'm not in publishing directly, but from the outside looking in, it's raggedy, it's trifling, and I mean, it just goes above and beyond the normal triflingness of publishing, obviously. The four, four is just too, too goddamn many. So that's a hot mess and we'll move on. But if you thought that publishing meant anything by those behind those statements they made last year, for the most part, and they really didn't. So last year we got the news about the big five in publishing possibly going down to four. I still don't think that has gone through, but then I saw this article on Twitter and um, it's from the New York Times. And in the article, they still reference it as the big five. So it still hasn't gone through, but more news in publishing. So this article says HarperCollins to buy Houghton Mifflin's trade publishing unit. So the $349 million deal will help the publisher expand its back catalog at a moment of growing consolidation in the book business. We hate to see it. So this was published on March 29th of this year. HarperCollins, one of the five largest publishing companies in the United States, said on Monday that it had agreed to buy Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Books and Media, the trade publishing division of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt for $349 million. The acquisition will help HarperCollins expand its catalog of backlist titles at a moment of growing consolidation in the book business. Houghton Mifflin publishes perennial sellers by well-known authors such as J.R.R. Tolkien, George Orwell, Robert Penn Warren, Philip Roth, and Lois Lowry, as well as children's classics and best-selling cookbooks and lifestyle guides. Uh, now, the news of the sale was reported earlier by the Wall Street Journal. By acquiring Houghton Mifflin, HarperCollins, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch's News Corp. Oh, God, of course it is. Of fucking courses. Oh. Of course, it's owned by Rupert Murdoch's News Corp. They will be better able to compete as publishing has come to be dominated by the biggest players. The book business has been transformed by the consolidation in the past decade with the merger of Penguin and Random House in 2013. News Corp's purchase of the romance publisher Harlequin and Hachette Books Book Group's acquisition of Perseus Books. Last fall, Viacom CBS agreed to sell Simon & Schuster to Penguin Random House for more than $2 billion in a deal that has drawn scrutiny from antitrust regulators and has raised concerns among booksellers, authors, and agents. <sighs> Somehow, when I was reading this article, I must have skipped over this part. This says, some analysts have warned that within a decade or so, the industry may be left with only two big publishing companies. Penguin Random House and HarperCollins, which is the second largest trade publisher. Increasingly, the two of them are going to be competing for all the big books because they're going to be the only ones who can afford to. The remaining publishers, he added, are going to find it harder and harder to keep acquiring the kind of high profile new titles that make a big publisher a big publisher. That's news that I hope doesn't come true, but honestly, truly. Yeah, so several industry groups, including the American Booksellers Association and the Authors Guild, have said the Simon & Schuster deal could destabilize the industry and leave authors with fewer opportunities. Critics of the deal have also noted that consolidation often leads to more consolidation as smaller companies try to bulk up to compete. The article talks about the sale uh, will continue to transform publishing, which obviously has been affected by the pandemic saying publishers have seen a huge shift to online retail with e-commerce giants like Amazon and big box stores like Target and Walmart gaining an even greater share of book sales while many independent bookstores have struggled. 
At the same time, as people have turned to books for entertainment during lockdown, publishers benefited from a surge in sales. Revenues in 2020 climbed to $8.6 billion, an increase of nearly 10%, according to the Association of American Publishers, which tracks revenue from about 1,360 publishers. So publishers got money. They made more money last year, but yeah, you don't have money to print ARCs or send them to international bloggers, but that's just me. It also says by acquiring a mid-side trade publisher, HarperCollins, a global publisher that has more than 120 imprints and publishes 10,000 new books a year will gain an even larger backlist. Jesus Christ. And they will take over Houghton Mifflin's warehouse facility in Indiana, giving it a bigger distribution footprint. So this deal is expected to close on the second quarter of 2021. <sighs> so there's that. We hate to see it. Okay. So this is really random, but I like couldn't, I couldn't not talk about this book. And it is Life After Death by Sister Soldier. So I think it is heavily popular in the black community, but in 1999, so like almost 20 years ago, the Coldest Winter Ever was published by Sister Soldier, and it's like a beloved book. I've never read it, but I've heard about it for years. So now after all this time in 2021, it got a sequel and the people who love that book were super excited about the sequel and the sequel is called Life After Death. However, it is not the sequel most people were expecting and it went, it went a lot of places that it probably shouldn't have gone. So I saw a tweet and they were like, people are going in on this life after that death book. And I hadn't, I hadn't seen anything personally, but I was, you know, I'm nosy. So I'm like, let me go see. So I went to Goodreads. Currently the rating is at 2.56. I looked at this a couple weeks ago, but right now, if you look at the per, the percentage of breakdowns from one to five star, 37%, which is the overwhelming majority is one star reviews then 18% is two star. There is 19% at five star, but the majority are one star reviews. And so I like went to look at a review and I saw some of the things the person was saying, cause I've never been interested to read the book. So I was like, I'm not gonna read it. I can see spoilers. And I was like, uh, <laughs> what? So one of the reviews that I came across, I'm just gonna read part of it. It says, general description of some problematic plot points ahead. These are not super specific spoilers though. So if you don't wanna know anything about the book, I would suggest you skip. I'll just put spoilers on the screen and then when that's gone, then you can feel free to come back. But uh, this person's review says, to illustrate my point about the absurdity of the plot, this book includes the following, bizarre and underdeveloped notions about Islam slash religion in general, some strange culty bullshit, sprinklings of body shaming, slash fat phobia, anti-choice propaganda, i.e. descriptions of shaming of drug uses, drug addiction, some incredibly culturally insensitive descriptions of various characters of different ethnicities, homophobia, casual and internalized misogyny, a weird obsession with silky hair, hello, internalized anti-blackness, colorism, texturism, and literal Seriously, what the fuck, soldier? And that's just the tip of this disastrous iceberg because problematic content aside, Cold as Winter was not without its flaws, as we all know. This book was just very poorly done. It did not accomplish what it set out to do and it didn't advance Winter's overall story in the slightest. It was a wholly unnecessary sequel and quite a jarring and uncomfortable reading experience overall. That was the review I read and I was like, hold up. So I went to YouTube. <laughs> I think that I've watched almost every review of this book because it just, ha, the, what do the kids say? It sent me, it is still sending me. It is so ridiculous. And I don't want to shit on this woman's book, especially my black woman's book, but this is absurd. It, it is absurd. And so as you heard in that, there's a lot of mess in it. Essentially the coldest winter ever, the main character is winter and she's this really like narcissistic, self-absorbed person and anyway she goes to jail at the end of that book so the beginning of coldest winter ever starts with her getting out of jail it's been like 15 years and yes i basically know the entire plot of life after death because i've watched so many videos on it but so the beginning of the book starts with her getting out of jail but she gets shot and she dies so she spends the majority of this book in purgatory 
And so that's people are getting like this weird religious message from the story. So she's in purgatory, but apparently even though after she's died, she's still acting the same. She only care about herself. She cares about like brands and fashion and money and all of these things. And you know, just worrying about herself. So in this mess of a book, she's in purgatory. She also um, comes across Satan's son and his name is, and I can't remember exactly, no one's, I can't find it in the reviews, but I think that his literal name in the book is Dat or That in Word 66. I think that's literally what he's called in the book. And she ends up like becoming, entering a sexual relationship with him. And um, I guess she has these like boundaries that she's not supposed to cross. But anyway, anytime they have essentially she turns into an animal and she turns into a dog at one point into a, a snake and a rat I think were the three animals but when they were talking <laughs> when they were talking about her turning into a dog it was that she turned into a dog and then they consent and continue to have relations so that's why they're saying they be somebody came into at a point <clears throat> and there's also the devil himself i think his name is like shaitan or satan or something like not exactly satan but he's there and you know down there they're just like living their best life with money and cars and clothes and all of this stuff and i'm like what she also comes across like these two kids who are like trying to get her to see the error of her ways and then you figure out that it's her children that she had no in the first book and she was pregnant with twins a boy and a girl and so they're here now and there's like a point where they're like you you know <clears throat> and I think it's her kids that are like offering her this chance to go to heaven instead of you know staying in purgatory or going down to hell and saying that she basically has to and I don't know how this works in Islam so I don't want to get it wrong but you know the equivalent to like repent and acknowledge that Allah is you know the all-powerful so it's really pushing Islam which is fine I don't consider myself a part of any religion but it just seemed they said in the book that it seemed it was pushing that that those are just some of the things like I said I've watched a lot of reviews and some people go into more detail than others but it just it sucks when you've been waiting so long for something and then it turns out to be this I know Ashley a book is wrong recently read this I cannot wait for her review and this just sounds I just don't like the idea of all that like preachy messaging kind of thing in there and just all the shaming and and this really just seems judgmental so yeah if you had any interest in that or heard anything about it it just sounds kind of, no it's, it's a, it sounds a hot mess i'll link some of the videos that i watched who kind of explain all this stuff but that just sister no no sister girl no at first i was like do i dare read this and you know give a full no mm -mm, i don't have time i'm not doing it i'm not doing it did you just wake up from a nap okay Whew. this is our second take had to take a break for a minute collect some notes and now i'm back So on the topic of authors pushing really problematic, harmful ideas in their books, I wanted to bring up another author, um, and this was brought to my attention by Rachel on Twitter. And so the author name is Jessie Manassen, I believe that's how you pronounce it, but she also is writing young adult dystopian books now under the name Jess Corbon. So Jessie Manassen, is a white christian lady which is fine but she seems to be a part of that like fundy side that evangelical side of christianity where it's like about evangelizing and preaching the gospel and trying to get people to come into their sect whatever you want to call it anyway so she has some non-fiction books that are published under her name jesse manassen and then she changed her name to jess corban to publish the ya dystopian books because she said that she didn't want to limit the target audience wanted to separate the non-fiction from the fiction and wanted to be able to reach more people 
i.e. reach people who probably if they're just like looking at the book maybe where it's shelved the cover don't read much into it might just grab it thinking it's a normal why dystopian book and this is being released by like a Christian publisher so I'm not how sh sure how big the the reach will be how big the release will be but there's still people who may come across this and think it's you know a harmless fiction book when really it's it's really gross and anti a lot of things written by somebody with really gross thoughts and so I won't to go into everything because there's a lot of problematic mess with her but I'll link Rachel made two videos on this that I'll link down below and if you don't agree with what I'm saying what Rachel is saying that's fine but don't start like leaving negative comments or whatever but I feel like a majority of people here in the bookish community are way more open-minded and under understanding and would get why I find and Rachel finds this harmful so Jesse Manasson has many nonfiction books but one is called unashamed she also runs this website that like I thought it said live laugh love but it's pretty much the uh, the Jesus version of that and the website is called live love and god.com and her target audience is really like teenage girls and basically where they can um, write in questions and she answers them and gives the godly advice and uh big yikes there so she one of her nonfiction books is called unashamed overcoming the sins no girl wants to talk about and so some of these sins as you can see on the cover include uh bulimia addiction cutting drinking anorexia um sex so you know really anything is basically a sin and so this thread by Rachel, she said, trigger warning religion, advocating for conversion therapy, a thread about a wildly homophobic debut author. And so she goes through all of this because she was first brought aware of this new book under Jess Corbon. Got this inkling of fundiness from her, from her previous experience in evangelical circles and then found that Jess Corbon is also Jesse Manasson and she just has really harmful views so everything is very anti-gay like anti-queer there's even like anti-vax rhetoric she's very that men are being emasculated so anti-feminism anti anything that doesn't fit within her little Christian bubble and so there are excerpts that she shares in the video and I mean you could go to the website if you want to but there's like questions about um, pornography and masturbation which she's very anti anti sex work all of those things like how can I forgive myself if I did this like is masturbation wrong and it's like yes it is uh, she puts everything basically into sin like that is wrong and you need to ask God's forgiveness and you can read my books or go to my website for more help so people write in asking like is masturbation wrong and it's like yes is having feelings for someone of the same sex wrong it's like yes but at least if you're not if you're having those feelings like don't act on them because then that's even a greater sin and here's ways to correct that because that is improper thinking that's not what God wants so she is very that kind of person very preachy there's an excerpt from her website where a girl contacted her about possibly being queer so she said that homosexuality is a sin and says to find help it's not realistic to think you can ditch unwanted same-sex attraction with a snap of your fingers is god able to change a person's heart and mind absolutely will he do it with a snap of his fingers not usually that's why i encourage you to find people and ministries who can walk with you in this journey accountability Accountability is going to take some guts on your part. You don't have to tell your friends, but please talk to a parent, your pastor, a Christian counselor, or a mentor who can walk you through this process. You can also search specifically here for SSA resources, which Rachel mentioned sounds very similar. Like she's pointing them to conversion therapy options. She brought this up, like brought the attention to the author and she didn't respond. She just deleted the comments. And so she just wanted to spread the awareness. Like I said, I'm gonna link the videos down there, but I haven't seen these books pop up but still there could be someone you know or maybe you find this book and that book that I was just referencing was her nonfiction one unashamed but the YA dystopian ones that she has coming out or maybe it just came out the first one is called a gentle tyranny which says Nade rising which is just eaten backwards with a freaking accent and 
the premise of this book is basically that men there's men called brutes and then there's men called gentles and those the ones have been you basically emasculated because she's basically saying like you know the state of our world in feminism are we're emasculating men and that's just leading to so much destruction and it's supposed to be a new twist to a dystopian novel um, with heart pounding action thought provoking revelations in a setting as lush as the jungles of Central America because she's traveled to like Belize before on her missionary work uh i roll so it sounds a hot ass mess nade rising and there's just a lot of harmful rhetoric in all of her books but they are the same person jesse manass and jess corban all this information will be linked down below so if you see them i'm not saying not to read them i can't tell you what what to read or not to read but just if that pops up and it maybe sounds interesting just know what this person is about and the messages that are going to be shared in that book to make yourself aware but again rachel's videos will be down below very informative but will make you angry because it's disgusting and obviously i know people like this exist but the sneaky tactic of trying to like change her name to get into like a broader probably more secular audience to try and spread this message i don't like that okay lastly we talk about lindsay ellis now lindsay ellis came up in a video i think last year around the election um because she was like live tweeting basically like waiting for results to come in from georgia i believe but was using only like black gifs. It was really weird. So people were saying it was like digital blackface and I had never heard of her before this moment, but apparently she's a YouTuber and author. I don't know if she's also an author tuber and like talks about her books, but she's a YouTuber. She has like a million subscribers, which is a fucking lot. And uh, like 300,000 followers on Twitter. So I don't follow her, but she apparently has instances of, of putting her foot in her mouth. And this time it was about so raya the last dragon i think is what it's called is that a new disney movie i haven't seen it in avatar the last airbender so her tweet was also watched raya and the last dragon and i think we need to come up with a name for this genre that is basically avatar the last airbender reduxes it's like half of all ya fantasy published in the last few years anyway and so i guess she just tweeted that as a whatever these are the same things and got off the internet probably what i love when people like say i just I just tweeted this as a throwaway thought. I didn't think anyone would say anything, but it's like, you have a 300,000 followers. Like maybe if I tweeted something like that, I don't, I have maybe what, 1,500 followers? And then they're like, oh, I woke up and oh, all of this drama. It's like, come on now. So then the next day, I think, or maybe, yeah, because her tweet says, okay, this was fun to wake up to. It's always that, it's always that. Like, did you really just close Twitter and then you didn't open your phone until the next day? I bet you were just sitting there watching the discourse and see how much it blew up, but whatever, that's just my opinion. So Lindsay Ellis said, okay, this was fun to wake up to, probably going to delete the original tweet, even though it's going to screen caps town, but I'd rather them have fun with screen caps than quote tweets. So I'll just say this, I wasn't referencing the similar settings of Raya and Avatar, to be clear. Raya more than anything reminded me of a few YA fantasies from the last few years, namely Children of Blood and Bone and Blood Air, which are not only not based in Asian folklore, Nigerian and Russian Chinese respectively, but the authors were openly inspired by The Last Airbender. Considering we have basically an entire generation of American writers who are heavily influenced by The Last Airbender, my thought was, hmm, this is a trend. Wonder if there will be a name for this. I wasn't thinking of the specific inspo for The Last Airbender and Raya, and that was careless. I can see where if you squint, I was implying all Asian inspired properties are the same, especially if you are already privy to those conversations where I had not seen them. But the basic framework of The Last Airbender is becoming popular in fantasy fiction outside of Asian inspired stuff. And that is what I was referring to. And it is truly exhausting to just be constantly blindsided by these really uncharitable interpretations of whatever offhand thought I'm having, especially considering these are properties with all white creative heads. And you know what? You're right. Someone once joked, I don't tweet like someone with 300k plus followers and they were right to i don't get the luxury of a throwaway tweet and i'll keep that in mind going forward 
which is how you should think already. A million subscribers on you on YouTube and 300K plus on Twitter. There is no throwaway tweet. Maybe that's your throwaway message in your group chat, but this is what I don't understand with people with big accounts. You don't get to just throw away tweets. There's so many people watching who can take various levels of offense. She was receiving a lot of critiques, some of it probably over the top and unwarranted and some was warranted or just responses to what she said. So she deleted her Twitter. As of now, it's deleted. So going back to her original tweet which was also watched ryan the last dragon i think we need to come up with a name for this genre that is basically avatar the last airbender reduxes it's like half of all white fantasy published in the last few years and so in her explanation she was saying the framework of the last airbender is becoming popular in fantasy fiction outside of asian inspired stuff but again she didn't say it like that so what people were taking problem with and this is a tweet um, that says Lindsay Ellis basically made a bad throwaway tweet that compared Raya to that okay so this person's tweet is paraphrasing but they said Lindsay Ellis basically made a throwaway tweet that compared Raya to derivative Avatar The Last Airbender inspired fantasy young adult and Asian Twitter went did you really compare two of the only pieces of Asian fantasy media to each other because it really read like she was calling Raya derivative of Avatar The Last Airbender instead of being inspired by real life Asian cultures and carrying with it these long coded complicated histories of Asian representation and monoliths and appropriation. Lindsay Ellis basically woke up and posted additions to the thread saying that she's talking about the hero to unite four divided nations etc and basically saying she didn't mean to say Asian culture is a monolith even though despite her intent that was the impact then she signed off with a kind of ableist throwaway tweet and has since deleted her Twitter because of the barrage of comments directed at her both in terms of valid critique of her perpetuating anti-Asian assertions and just assholes putting out bad faith criticism in order to de-platform de her but it's like I'm not so much mad as disappointed the right thing to do would have been to acknowledge the valid critique about how she hurt and already marginalized racialized community and then stepped away for her mental health but the fact the valid critique got buried and now stepped away <clears throat> so i wanted to share this thread by june because i have not seen neither the avatar the last airbender or raya don't come at me i know people love avatar the last airbender okay and i'm not asian so i wanted to get this perspective from an asian person and june's thread starts as a southeast asian with chinese roots a young adult fantasy author and someone who has a love hate relationship with avatar the last airbender I I gotta get this off my chest. One, Avatar The Last Airbender was created by two white men. We are not going to hold it up as the standard for Asian fantasy writing or animation. Two, do not equate one Asian fantasy with, with another Asian fantasy just because they are both Asian. Both shows draw from different cultures in Asia. If they seem similar to you, it's because cultures can overlap due to forces like imperialism, colonialism, globalization, etc. If cultures seem the same, maybe you need to do more research, read a history book, Google, I don't know, broaden your mind. That bit about why a fantasy doesn't sit right with me, like how am I supposed to interpret it? That recent diverse why fantasies are all the same to you? If so, yikes. I mean, similar themes do not equal the same stories. Also, if the themes are about fighting an oppressive regime, then you gotta ask yourself, why are there so many stories about that from by POC authors? Even if she meant it as a casual throwaway, there's really no throwaway at her at her size. Someone tweeted, there's just so much to unpack. And I get it's a throwaway tweet, but when you have over 300,000 followers, there is no such thing as a throwaway tweet. And that's what uh, Lindsay replied to saying she doesn't get the luxury of a throwaway tweet. Well, she'll keep that in mind going forward. And then additionally, she said, and oh, one other thing, saying a thing is structurally similar to another thing is not a dig. Why do people immediately get defensive and think it's a dig? No story is truly original. There was a lot I didn't like about Raya, but it's similar to Avatar The Last Airbender. Wasn't it, you crazies? was her last tweet that I saw before she signed off. So I understand the frustration from people online because it just seemed like they were equating two things. And I don't know if Raya, I think also it's by Disney, but I think maybe an Asian creator was involved in producing that and Avatar The Last Airbender was created by two white dudes. But that was the controversy with her and so it's always okay to take a break from social media for your mental health because social media is a stressful place. But when you just like 
leave without like yeah she like cleared it up but it was in a really kind of snarky condescending way and I was like ah whatever I'm just gonna delete my Twitter for a while it's like that's not the way to handle it you know like I don't understand why people can't like accept critique like admit they're wrong and apologize and then be like you know this was stressful because I bet it's stressful to have a bunch of people in your replies or mentioning you and all of these criticisms because you know there's always people who take it too far totally get that but it's just like why can't you ever acknowledge what you did or said wrong and actually apologize and then be like okay i'm gonna take a, a little break it's never that it's always like well y'all read it like this but i meant it like this Ugh, i'm logging off of twitter that's that's always the wrong approach but that's just my opinion so whoo y'all it just stays popping my dms stay lit with tags and information on people being messy i woke up this morning to like more so if you think this series is ending anytime soon you would be wrong um there was recent mess and i talked about this on instagram with rachel hollis who i cannot stand and i think she might have to get her own video because she's so raggedy i need time to provide the history of her lies and deceit so stay tuned for that but um i just want to say thank you for my last two videos the one i did about mental mental health even though that one i didn't expect a bunch of people to watch it but the people who did watch it i've slowly been going through and reading all the comments so because so many people are being like open and sharing and, and so supportive i was really nervous to put that video up but it's been a really positive response and i'm glad that i shared it so that other people don't feel alone so i'm still working through the replies there and on the video I did on Saturday, while well, I'm not going to be able to reply to everyone because there's a lot of comments and some of them are long, I am trying to read them all because or I'm not opposed to hearing from other sides. So still trying to get through them all. I may not be able to reply, but I'm trying to read um, all of the comments, which have been mostly respectful. So I appreciate that as well. Anyway, if you have you know any interpretations or thoughts to add to the things that i talked about this week please let me know in the comments and also how do you feel like i really want to know how you feel about the jerry crystal arc thing like doesn't that seem ridiculous that one just seems excessively ridiculous but i'm gonna go and it's already one o'clock so i'm gonna go make myself some lunch and then i'll have to edit this long motion this long feature film for you all but Thank you for watching. Please have check out the description that'll have links to any of the articles or videos, whatever I mentioned in this video, and links to <sighs> tragic events that are going on worldwide, ways you can learn about them and donate if possible. Also, if you do watch Rachel's videos, maybe donate to her Kofi because she put a lot of work and time and mental stress on herself to do this research on that raggedy ass author. So always think about that. There are links to my social medias, Nigel's social media, and ways to support my channel if you'd like to do that. But we want you to put on your lip chat, which I need some right now and I don't know where mine is. Put on your lip chat, put on your sunscreen, wear your mask, wash your mask, you know, stay distant from people, get your vaccination if you can. Um, what else? What else do we want to tell them? Wash your hands, you know, wash your legs, things like this. These are important things. <laughs> Drink some water. We love you. We will see you in our next one. Bye.